Hello everyone and welcome to How to Get to the Moon, a basic rundown on various ways that people have imagined to reach the lunar surface and in some cases return back from it. And of course we are starting with the most famous, uh, the elephant in the room if you will, the Apollo system. Uh, in the next video hopefully I will cover the N1-L3 system and we'll move on from there to uh, other hypothetical systems and perhaps uh, probes like uh, Surveyor and Luna 9. But uh, I wanted to discuss, you know, exactly how you go about getting some of these things to their destination. And uh, we are, of course, using Kerbal Space Program. Uh, these basic tips should apply to many different versions and uh, incorporate lots of different mods. So uh, first, um, for your launch tower, <laughs> I guess that's the basic thing. Uh, we have here Alpha Mense's modular launch pads scaled. I put tweak scale on it. And that's what gives me this uh, launch construct here. Uh, if you're going to be doing a reenactment of Apollo or something like that, you might want to pick up that mod and add tweak scale to the parts. But uh, I, I don't know if it comes with a tweak scale script or not. Uh, building the rocket, we'll just go from the top down. Uh, first of all, this launch escape system. And uh, below that, it depends on which uh, pod you use. If you use um, SSTU, then the arrow uh, cap here and the parachutes are built in. Here we have the docking mechanism probe to dock with the lunar module, then the arrow cap, and then the parachutes. And this is the FASA model of these. So it's assembled like that. And then with the launch escape system on top. And then we have a decoupling mechanism here, uh, command service module decoupler. And make sure that uh, your version has a heat shield at the bottom of the command module, otherwise you're gonna get a nasty surprise on your way back. And then the service module may have experiments in this bay right here, and uh, should also incorporate a high gain antenna, which I don't see on this. Oh, right, it's at the bottom. So uh, we should open this. Now, there's there's the high gain antenna right there. So, yeah, make sure you have the high gain antenna. It should also have a light. I um, don't know where the light is, but uh, that's not critical. That's the docking light. Well, let's see. All right, uh, Apollo service module docking light is what I was looking for. And, well, that should do the trick get exactly where it's put. You might want to consult a diagram. I don't want to get blasted by the thrusters. I'll put it right there. Anyway, uh, so there is the docking light and then the AJ-10-137 is a service propulsion system and this fuel right here is going to allow you to do mid-course corrections, get you into orbit around the moon, and then uh, burn for the return from the moon. And you can see the load that we have right here and according to MechJeb uh, this is 2,511 meters per second here, but uh, it's probably counting the launch escape system and not counting the mass of the service uh, of the lunar module there. It's nearly an 11 minute burn time here. And what you'll want to do is also make sure that you have enough supplies at this point. Make sure you have 14 days for any Apollo mission. And you can see with uh, three crew, we have 14 days of food, water, and oxygen. Technically, you do not need to fill up with the water because uh, this contains fuel cells which will generate water from uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Though, you have to make sure to actually pack hydrogen and oxygen. So we have LH2 here and oxygen there for the fuel cells. Uh, the MMH and NTO are used for the RCS thrusters, but the main engine uses Aerozine in N204. So, you're going to have to watch out for your RCS fuel separately because that can run out and you might, you'll might you still have this engine but you won't be able to turn. There is no reaction wheel on Apollo. There is no way for it to turn without the RCS. So you'll have to use that sparingly especially when docking with the lunar module. And the lunar module is nestled in this which is the interstage pedal adapter. This one is from SSTU. So, so far all these parts up here have been from FASA, but we are using a mixed system here and this is the SSTU interstage pedal adapter, which is better than the FASA one. 
and you can see the parameters that I've set here. Fairing texture A, top diameter 4, bottom diameter 6.6 .6 meters, total height 10.7, and taper height 2.8. Unfortunately, of course, it's not supposed to tilt out the taper portion. That is not supposed to happen, but it still looks better than the FASA one with the panels flinging out all over the place. So I decided to use it. Uh, you cannot clip the lunar module in this base. I tried that. It explodes. So yeah. The lunar module, of course, has fuel tanks in, in itself, and those are for the ascent, and then there's the descent module here. And the RCS for the FASA model is built in. It relies on the command module to actually finish the docking, though it's possible for it to do the docking. Don't forget, uh, well, actually, the drogue, I believe, is built into this model, so you don't have to add it separately. So, yeah, that will be what docks to the probe on this side. You can see the fuel loads that we have here and the oxygen, food. You don't really need to top off the food on this. And Li here is lithium hydroxide, which is used to clear out the carbon dioxide. And that's not, um, that's not critical. That's not going to kill Kerbals in the game, but you might want to pay attention to that. And so the engine at the bottom here, it's sort of in here, is called Lunar Module Ascent Engine. And then there is, I guess I'll have to very carefully, oh, that probably ruined everything. Oh, we still got the engine there. Okay. Um, uh, you see this ring here? That is the stage separator between the ascent and descent module. That comes with FASA. And then you have the descent module and its legs. And then the lunar module descent engine. The descent engine has uh, three ignitions. The ascent engine has 10 ignitions. The descent engine does throttle, the ascent engine does not. So you're gonna have to watch out. The ascent engine also, I believe, does not gimbal. It relies completely on the RCS thrusters to help with turning. Okay, and so it's nestled like that in here. And make sure that colliders are disabled. They should be by default. Okay, then the next part we have is the instrument unit. And uh, I believe this version is from DECQ, is that right? Yeah, DECQ instrument unit. And so now instead of FASA, we're using parts from DECQ's Apollo Saturn V. And that includes this uh, third stage tank, as well as these auxiliary propulsion systems, which have the RCS fuel to settle the fuel down for the reignition of the J2 on this third stage. This J2 is from FASA though. So it's a mixed system. Now, very important, when configuring this J2, make sure you pick the right one. And that is the 230K one with 1,023 kilonewtons. Otherwise, you're not going to have enough fuel. And make sure this tank, uh, you might want to take a look at what the actual burn time for the mission that you're recreating is. But in general, eight minutes and 20 seconds is correct. So that's how much you want to pack. It finishes orbit around the Earth and does the transfer to the Moon. So you have to finish up orbit around the Earth, and I'll show you how to do that with 3,200 meters per second left. And I'm going to assume that you're not going to use uh, KOS to do this. So we'll, we'll handle that launch manually. Uh, these things sticking out are separatrons. They are built into this particular model of it. And uh, so are these things here on the interstage. So there is a S2 payload decoupler and adapter shroud, and that has the decouplers there. And then finally, well not finally, the S2 tank. And again, you're going to have to be careful about how you load this up. Its nominal burn time is six minutes. You can see that here. And so make sure your configuration of J2s down here uh, is correct. And if you just use the default load here, you might not have the right fuel mixture. So you might want to dump it out and add fuel back in. You'll note that I have available volume here because I wanted to get it to exactly eight minutes. And uh, here we do not have available volume. So this is topped off completely. So a little bit of a different situation there. But if you try and top this off completely, you're going to make it too heavy for the first stage if you're trying to recreate Apollo 11. 
and you can see the first stage has very low thrust weight ratio right now. An upgraded F1 was used on the later Apollo missions and I don't know if they have a configuration for that but the upgraded F1 would be able to carry a heavier load on it. Uh, right now this tank is also underfueled by 109 kiloliters and that gives it a burn time of 2 minutes and 37 seconds. That's not really how long it's going to burn because both for the upper stage, uh, the second stage, sorry, and the first stage, we're going to shut off the center engine partway through. The center engine doesn't gimbal on either stage, so uh, keep that in mind so you can see gimbal is off on this F1 at the center, same with the J2 up there, and uh, we will have the timing for the engine shutdown there. Um, and then we have, of course, four more F1s. Their configuration is, there's just one F1 configuration. I'm not entirely sure which that's tuned for. If it's the later Apollo flights, this seems pretty onerous because uh, I don't think it can get off the ground very easily with a full fuel tank here. So that's about it for the VAB. Let's take it outside and see how to fly it. Okay, here we are on the launch pad and you'll notice it's a little bit wobbly. Um, I did put launch clamps all around this to try and stabilize it and eventually will and uh, the thing is if you just put it on the rocket uh, that just makes it more wobbly because it's holding the whole thing from here instead of with a wider base so this is a better arrangement overall and of course it's important to have launch clamps in order to replenish the hydrogen and oxygen which would otherwise boil off so a word about timing you'll notice it's August 16th 1969 for Apollo 11, it should be July 16th, 1969 at uh, 1.32 p.m. UTC, so in about 17 minutes. But in real solar system, because the date everything is set in motion is 1951, by the time you get to 1969, everything is totally off. So that's thing one. Thing two is that the inclination is off anyway. Uh, I actually decided to set things in motion at 1969 in this save, in this entire install in fact. So the starting date in this install is 1969 so that the moon will not be so far off. But the inclination is still far off. And um, if you try to do it on July 16th and try to launch at the right time, your inclination gap will be about 15 degrees. Uh, here we have about 5 degrees and it's counting down, so that's good. We can correct 5 degrees on launch, that's doable. 15 degrees on launch, not so easy. Not if you still want to have enough fuel to get to the moon. Now this whole issue is completely irrelevant if you don't need to launch at exactly the right time, right? Unless you're really adamant about launching at the right time of day, okay, so at uh, 13.32 there, it's not going to be a big deal. You can launch whenever the relative inclination is at a minimum. You know, uh, from Cape Canaveral, you, it can get as low as 0.25 degrees. But I want to recreate uh, Apollo 11, and the best sort of situation is around August 16th. Uh, it's not July 16th because of the inclination. I said to August 16th, and because the moon has gone around once, right, uh, one lunar orbits around 29 days. Uh, this is a good deal. Actually, probably August 14th would have been better because that's a little bit closer to one lunar month, uh, you know, one orbit of the moon. So, yeah, we might be a little bit late. We'll see how that works out. So now we have to launch this, and if you're using a straight FASA model, everything will work the same. Normally, I'd use KOS to manage the launch, and that's because it'll do everything at exactly the right time. As it is, I'm going to have to be looking at an Apollo 11 timeline to get everything exactly right. One of the tricks is you do not wait for the stages to run out of fuel. In real life, stages have some fuel left over. We have to shut off the engines manually. So outboard engine cutoff will be manual. That's action grouped right now. So without further ado, let's get, take the crew access arm back. So that's action group one. The other arms will be Action Group 2, and we have throttled up, SAS is on, and I'll do the launch manually as best I can, and, uh, well, we're a little bit early, so let's time warp. 
and the inclination gets better as we time warp. Okay, that's the right time. Uh, we're actually about 40 seconds late. Now, throttle up. Ignition. Ac uh, the arms back. And launch. Now you saw the camera did a sort of weird thing right at the start. And that's because the launch pad is really heavy. And the camera focuses on the center of mass. To avoid that, you can uh, right click on this and aim camera at the instrument unit. Then the camera will hold steady. Once we're clear of the tower, we can use Smart ASS. Now, the rocket did a roll program. Uh, initially, that was because of the orientation of the launch pad, but we don't need to do that. What I typically aim for is about 1,200 meters. We should be at 85 degrees pitch. The Saturn V turns a lot faster than you might think it does based on the really low thrust to weight ratio. And that's because we need a whole lot of horizontal velocity by the end of the first stage. And so right now I'm very attentive to our pitch, making sure that we turn at a good rate. I want to be at 75, uh, sorry, 70 degrees at 4 kilometers or so. And here about 60 degrees, 7 kilometers, I'll hold it through the uh, dynamic pressure and through the speed of sound. Uh, so let's check that separation of the first stage. And then ignition of the second stage engines. Separation of the skirt. Separation of the tower. And we can start correcting that relative inclination. We don't have to do too much. Maybe just 2 degrees of heading for now. We can see the target marker for the moon and how different it is from where we are. We have to watch out for the timing of the center engine cutoff. That's at 2 minutes and 15 seconds. And by the end of the first stage, we want to have a time to apoapsis of 1 minute and 40 seconds. I'm going to hold this at 30. You can see our time to apoapsis is going up. We've cut off the center engine. And we can probably pitch down a little bit more now. Yeah, time to apoapsis is high enough. The outer engine cutoff is 2 minutes and 41 seconds. Definitely good enough. I'll hold it at 24 even though our time to apoapsis is higher. Okay, that's outer engine cutoff, separation. Take a look at the velocity we're going at. That's what we should be aiming for. Anything above 2,300 meters per second surface velocity is good at this point. And again, time to apoapsis around 1 minute and 40 seconds. Now we need to check on skirt set, and uh, that is 3 minutes and 12 seconds. Launch escape tower is 3 minutes 17, closer to 18 seconds. So skirt set. And tower jettison. And I'm just going to hold the pitch to 24 degrees for now. Remember at the end of making orbit, we need about 3,200 meters per second in the third stage. So 14 degrees. We should hover around 180 kilometers. Actually, it ran out. I'm not entirely sure why, but okay. Separation. And ignition. Should have lasted till 9 minutes and 8 seconds. I'll have to check on that. Maybe I didn't do things quite at the right time. Uh, it's possible that I should have waited a little bit longer before igniting the second stage. Uh, after separation of the first stage. 
we want to keep the vertical speed relatively close to zero. Hopefully without pitching down too much. And shut down. 196 by 183. So that would be a fine orbit. And now we have to manage a transfer to the moon. Obviously this has another ignition. You can see we have 3,551, which is more than enough. Now if you wanted to transfer to the moon, if you wanted to plot that manually, um, you could do it like this and make sure that the apoapsis is going to hit a little bit, basically 30 degrees ahead, maybe 45-ish of the moon. The exact time of the burn in real life was about uh, 420, uh, sorry, 416 p.m. UTC, so it's a whole orbit and then a little bit more. So we can delay for an orbit. And if we think about 416, that's about um, two and a half hours here. So two hours, 36 minutes. It'd be all the way back here, but that's the start of the burn, not the actual, you know, average of the burn, which is what Kerbal Space Program gives us. Right around here is more like the average of the burn. And we will manage a free return trajectory. All right, now it's time for these guys, the auxiliary propulsion systems. And basically they have the RCS and also the engine to sell the fuel down. And that staging enabled the RCS as well. I believe they're set to a higher thrust than they ought to be. They run out of propellant a little bit too fast with these configurations, or at least much faster than the FASA ones will. So the remaining burn time on the stage is 5 minutes and 24 seconds, and I normally figure it's uh, we're not going to use all the fuel, and we need to start about 3 minutes to 3 minutes and 20 seconds ahead of time, ahead of the node. Okay, it does say very stable right now. Um, but I guess I'll do it the way it should be done. That sound shouldn't happen. These, these don't make that big a sound. <laughs> so we've got the APS system active right now. And they should be much tinier in sound. But activate the engine. And now we're on our way on translunar injection. Yeah, uh, these should last for the entire burn time and provide the ability to continue propelling it forward a little bit to adjust the approach. I feel like they're a little bit overpowered right now. I could toggle them. I set them to action group 6. I guess that's alright. I do want to have enough uh, RCS fuel in the APS so that I can hold the stage steady when I separate off the command and service module, flip around and dock. You can see the total burn was about 3,150 meters per second, halfway is 1,575. We're a little bit late, but not that much late. Okay, focusing on the map now. Now often at about this point, 200 meters per second, I'll turn off Smart ASS and turn on SAS to prevent it from wobbling with the maneuver. And then once I see the orbit approach, I shut down. And this is a good time to shut off the J2 and get the APS up again. It doesn't really have the delta V for this though. 
we're just gonna have a crash into the moon and then I'll do the rest with the service propulsion system. Technically you should, you know, have the proper orbit. What I should have done was let the orbit uh, go past this, perhaps, and that would have been a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna use the action group which said uh, Pell adapter and deploy payload, but before I do that, I'm going to enable the RCS up here. Okay, so that was action group four. Well, did it actually separate that off? No. Okay, so that action group did not do the thing that I thought it would. Nope, it's not a being. Okay, there we go. Um, decouple top payload. Okay, now. Obviously, we're going to set that as a target. And remember, the RCS fuel is limited. Only 285 units of the MMH altogether. And that includes the stuff up here. So subtract out 47 units from that. SAS off and flip. I suppose while we're here, we should extend the high gain. And definitely... Oh, I missed the light. Oh, because I reloaded the craft file. Having taken stuff off and put stuff back on, the staging was wrong. So I've missed the light. Okay. One nice thing about Smart ASS is this negative parallel thing. You will use a little bit more fuel, so that's the downside, but should be okay. And it'll point to where your line going out from your docking port is parallel to the targets and then what you want to do is set the prograde vector to the opposite side of the target vector and you can have a little competition about how little fuel you use to do this maneuver it is a very discreet maneuver I'm sure the astronauts competed during simulation and in real life, uh, when doing it in real life. Okay. And there we go. So now RCS off. And yeah, so however many units of MMH that was, we will now decouple the inner node. And it did not explode, that's good. Pulling the limb away. And while we're at it, we should take a look at our orbit here. Oh, uh, well, this sh should work, right? Yeah. The direction we're pulling the limb away is the right direction. And here I'm using the MMH. The LEM's RCS is not active. And one little trick is make sure the flow priority on this is lower than on the command module. Otherwise, you're going to deplete this food, water, and oxygen first, and then when you get to the moon and put them in, they will die instantly. I've done that too many times already. Okay, I'm aiming for about 100 kilometers there. The initial orbit they, oops, the initial orbit they capture into is a little bit elongated, about 100 by 160 or so, and then they lower it down again. Okay, so we're good. Um, you can do a passive thermal control sort of thing, which is the barbecue roll, but that's not strictly necessary here. And we'll, we'll arrive in two days and 13 hours, which is worryingly fast. If you want to do this properly, uh, I, so I got there a little bit fast. I should have aimed for about three days. Uh, lunar orbit insertion should be three days, three hours into the mission. We're five hours in, so that's another uh, two days, 22 hours. We're about nine hours ahead, which means we're going a little bit faster, which means we're going to have to burn a little bit more fuel to slow down. I should note that I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to my free return trajectory. Technically, the periapsis should be a little bit lower, and that's a heck of an apoapsis. We definitely went a little bit too fast here. Okay, we have entered the Moon's Sphere of Influence, and now would be a good time to do some corrections. Uh, the main in inclination correction burn should be as a mid-course adjustment, but uh, we can't really see the landing location properly, or at least plot it with MechJeb, 
properly until we enter the SOI. And so now I've entered the target coordinates for the Apollo 11 landing and we see that it is right there. And if we are going to make orbit, I've I applied an adjustment before, but I don't think we need that one. And so if we make orbit just like this, we'll make sure that our path goes over the target site. It took some doing to make sure, because I had uh, repositioned the moon for 1969, I also had to make sure its rotation was correct with respect to the Earth and adjust that as well. It's a little bit hard to see right now, but of course the landing site in this case should be facing the Earth, very important. Um, and it looks like we do need an adjustment, right? So this path that we have to make orbit is going to be a little bit above the target site. And like this, uh, as part of the orbital burn, we're not going to be able to correct that. So we are going to make a correction maneuver. And we're going to try to do that precisely. But yeah, another uh, factor is that the sun angle over the landing site should be between 5 degrees and 14 degrees for Apollo 11. And that's because they wanted the sun to cast shadows so that the crew could see the craters easily. Also note that with our flight path like this, going clockwise, uh, retrograde, the sun will be behind the crew as they attempt to land and not in their eyes. So that's also a thing. But yeah, they wanted uh, shadows to be cast. But I think this is a little bit close to the Terminator. It's tough to tell, really. Okay, I'll get into this standby orbit. It's a little bit different from what they got into. But I'm not going to complicate things. And this time we will use the service propulsion engine. And I have to be really careful about this. Because every time I try and light it, I accidentally decouple things. And it's this engine here. We need to fix staging. So I'm going to put that down there. And I don't know, if, if you don't stage it through normal staging, what happens is that um, you're going to end up not having the gimbal in Kerbal Space Program 1.3 at least. So, let me see. Okay, so presumably we activated through normal staging like that. And this is still disabled, even though that was in the staging first. Okay. The service propulsion system has 50 ignitions. It was really dependent on uh, the pressurance and how much they were carrying of that to, because it's a pressure fed engine and they needed a certain amount of pressurant in order to feed the fuel into the engine. You can see that with the lunar module, the total delta V for the service module is 1,750. And basically we need about 800 of that to get into orbit around the moon and then 800 to leave. However, uh, when we leave, we will not be carrying the lunar module. So it'll be much lighter. So we have plenty of fuel to spare actually. Looks like the gimbal is working enough. Now I said 800, however, we approached the moon very quickly. Remember, we're arriving early, and so we actually need more delta V to slow down. It's about 180 more. So you really want to get here at the right time instead of quicker. And it's quite severe. Uh, there's 180 meters per second more than it ought to be. Okay, the moon has eclipsed the sun. Well, covered up the sun. We're on the nighttime side. And we can barely, we, we can't really see much of it right now. We know it's there. Okay, we can see the horizon of it. And this burn is going to take uh, probably about six, seven minutes. So let's get started. So on the real mission, they got into orbit in two steps. They did an initial burn and then circularized, got into a lower orbit. I'll just do one burn here to simplify things. Part of the reason you want to do two burns is because the burn takes so long 
and so you're further away from the actual maneuver and the, the periapsis, which is the optimal point to do the maneuver. I do notice this little floaty bit here. I don't know why this model has that. I think it's attached to the command module because it comes along with us the entire way through re-entry. It's just some spare polygons floating out there. So again, this is all FASA and DECQ RO configurations I have are patchwork. They're only for certain parts. I'll try and get together a more complete realism overhaul patch for DECQ's models. We'll see. Um, there isn't one that's part of realism overhaul right now. And uh, yeah. So it's only a few parts that have been patched, mainly the tanks and the APS, I think. You'll note that uh, during the launch, we were using the FASA engines. So the engines need to be done as well for DECU's Apollo Saturn V. So uh, perhaps in a subsequent video, I'll just uh, link those in the video description once I have them done. So we are in orbit around the moon. It doesn't take that much to make a loose orbit around the moon, about 200 meters per second or 300. But to get into a tight orbit around the moon, it takes the full amount, 800, in this case, more than it should with 980. Remember, if there is an inclination gap between uh, your orbit and the target landing location, that's going to hurt the lunar module two ways during landing and during liftoff and rendezvous back with the command module. It can do it, though. Uh, to be honest, there is surplus in the lunar module for that sort of thing. That's why Neil Armstrong was able to hover above the surface for a minute, try and find a good landing spot. Here I'm taking a look at the periapsis going down, and I don't want it to go down too much. Now I'll cut it there. We may do a second burn, just uh, bring that apoapsis a little bit lower. The periapsis is pretty darn low right now. Okay, but that looks good for landing on that spot. I don't know if the monument is there, as it is in the stock game. We'll see. Now, they spent a long time around the moon. They basically spent an evening on around the moon before actually trying to make the landing. The lunar landing was uh, four days and six hours in, basically. We've arrived early, like I said. Uh, the time that we would have arrived if we did it on time was lunar orbit insertion, uh, three days, three hours, 49 minutes. So we're quite a bit early. And since we're already off schedule, I'm not going to obey the timing. I will get into a lower orbit, but then we will uh, oh, that's the that's the other stage. Why did it take so long to get here? <laughs> that's the S4B smashing into the moon. Interesting. Okay, that's good enough for me. Let's keep everything stable. And I would like to transfer Jeb. Bill? Let's just let that be. Okay, now we've got the full food, water, and oxygen. Arizina and N204s topped off. Electric charge is good. Electric charge not quite as good here, but it's okay. Um, the water, I think there's a fuel cell in there. Uh, I think there's enough water here anyway, but uh, we, we've been running the fuel cell here, so I'll just pump some extra water to level it out with the food on the in the command module. Okay. I think we're ready to undock. Okay, so Bob is going to be left up there. You could send your scientists down, that would be legit. RCS enabled. And drifting away. So, back in the command module, we see we have 1,546 meters per second left, which is way more than enough 
to do help with the rendezvous and then get back home. Getting back home will take about 800, 900 or so. So this stage, the lunar descent stage, um, says it has, I, I don't know if it's reading the stages quite right uh, because we've got staging wrong. So hold on a sec. There, uh, no. Well, I guess we're gonna find out in the most practical way possible. <laughs> uh, all right, so our landing spot is there. We're going to do an initial burn that will set us on a path to overshoot the target landing spot. And then we'll decelerate from there. So the initial burn is not very much. Now here again with this engine, it's sort of important that it's actually staged and has its gimbling. So I'm going to put the RCS thrusters down here and that engine there just in case it skips over one. I think that was the RCS thruster. I'm going to have five just in case. All right, now it's staged that engine and reached 2,833 meters per second in this stage. I might have to adjust that. I was under the impression that this stage had 2,600 only. But, so I'll review. Maybe it's because it's not reading this properly for some reason I don't understand. Now, I don't actually want to do this burn with the descent engine because we only have three ignitions on the descent engine. Technically, we should have deployed our gear by now. Uh, all right, all right, that's not possible. Okay, we'll give the descent engine a go, even though it's going to use one of its ignitions. So obviously we're going to have to use a lot of throttling on the descent engine, because it only has two ignitions left now. So show landing predictions. Right now we're overshooting by 1,200 kilometers. And let's see the timing on this. Well, the stage time says 10 minutes. We're not going to burn all of that. We're probably going to use about eight minutes of it unless we're hovering for a while. Um, that's in 36 minutes and out there's 47 minutes so that's a long time. Um, 36 minutes we'll say 28 minutes, no, 30 minutes. Because we're going to be slowing down as we go along, right? And we're expecting to burn about eight minutes so maybe five minutes ahead of time would be a good start. So around here-ish, we'll just have that as a marker. So two ways to manage the descent, throttling and pitch. Now, if somebody SS starts puffing the RCS a whole lot, I'll just do it manually with SAS help. The time to land is gonna go down pretty quickly. And we'll take a look at the suicide burn countdown as well down there. Those can be configured to display using MechJeb uh, with the custom window editor and the suicide burn countdown is under miscellaneous. You can see the target difference coming in and the suicide burn countdown going down fast and you can see the retro target marker. So one way of doing it is just to point at the retro target marker. They did pitch up during the retro burn, during the landing burn. So that is allowable. So you see the situation shaping up here. And as the target difference gets in, you can see our distance to the target is quite a bit longer than that. It's not coming in that quickly. But we can just throttle down to make sure it doesn't come in too quickly. I don't particularly want my vertical speed to go more than negative 100 meters per second. And I don't want to be going up either. So those are sort of two bounds. You can, but it sort of depends on your thrust weight ratio and everything and exactly how things are going if you want to violate those rules. We are currently expected to land in the Sea of Tranquility, so that's a good start. Oh, and obviously you don't want your suicide burn countdown to be going up. And maybe we want it to go down a little bit faster than that. We're approaching pretty high. Uh, starting off a little bit lower to the moon would not be a bad idea. 
Okay, suicide burn countdown is going up. Let me keep it a little bit more shallow. I sometimes forget exactly which way I should yaw in order to make sure that we're getting closer to the target. We're pointing a bit south here. And it certainly looks like we're too far north. We're coming closer to the end of the burn. I don't need that much suicide burn countdown left. What we do need to do is make sure that the target difference comes in now. It's still further away. Yeah, we need to follow up and pitch down for that. This is not an optimal approach. We're, uh, I should have managed it a little bit better, but we certainly have enough fuel for this. So now we're throttling down because I don't want to shut off the engine, but we don't need to decelerate so much. Well, we're pretty close, but probably not as close as I would like. I mean, we could sort of do the hover thing. And nudge our way over there. Okay, maybe I shouldn't be trying to land at the particular spot. I'm running out of fuel anyway. I don't know if I see a monument. Maybe we're still a bit far away. I really don't want any horizontal speed as I try and do the final approach to landing. Oh god, I've got too much. Uh, okay, no, we're okay. Oh, we've landed. Well, okay, that, that sun angle is less than 5 to 14 degrees here. We've got serious shadows. I don't see the monument around. So I don't know. I mean, I typed in the coordinates as I thought they were. But maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Oh well. Anyway, Jeb time. So they actually get out sort of flat because of the way the ladder is here. Um, oh well. Fine, don't use the ladder. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to get him up there, to be honest. The EVA packs don't work very well here. Okay, I'm going to just... Uh, EV well, it doesn't matter. It's not science mode. Plant a flag. Site name. Sea of Tranquility. Tranquility. Peace. Ah. Peace. Okay, I don't know why that popped up. All right. Could stay around here for quite a while the Oh god. Can I can I get him up there? I don't even know. Uh because the moon doesn't rotate very fast, so it's not going to rotate away from the Command module's orbit. Oh god. What if I can't get Jeb back in? I need to like get a secondary ladder on this. The thing is, Kerbals are short. So it's tough for them for them to reach the ladder when the ladder is the correct size. Okay, grab, grab, and board. Whew. All right. So you can stay around for a while, but I'm not going to. Um, the command module is technically ahead of us right there. That's what that is. Now, one thing that's good to have here is heading to target. So 263 is where we want to point in order to meet up with it. And I'm going to shut this down. I'm going to lock this fuel. I'm going to shut down the engine and everything. We've still got fuel here. Hopefully the engine works right. The RCS is a thing. Gonna throttle up. RCS on. And launch. And launch. Now this engine does not gimbal. 
so it's all RCS here. It does have more ignitions, but no throttling. As far as I know, it ought to have about 2,200 meters per second. I don't know about this 2,500. Again, I'll check the configurations. I need to do a little bit of work here. But this is FASA, so there's a different sort of situation. Orbital velocity around the moon is only 1,600 meters per second. So 2,200 is more than enough as it is. Of course, some of that is used by the RCS uh, when you come down. I don't need more than a minute of time to apoapsis, so we're good here. We want to be in a lower orbit than the target, which, because I left the periapsis really low, is a little bit difficult. But we can manage it so that we catch up. Um, ideally, you'd want to wait until it like, gets right, well, only a little bit past overhead. I'll keep about 40 seconds time to apoapsis and pitch accordingly. Okay, now at about a thousand meters per second, the time to apoapsis needs to start coming down, so I'll just point at the horizon. There seems to be an imbalance between Aerozine and NTO here, and that might be because the thrusters use a different mix than the main engine. So we're gonna go past apoapsis, but that's fine, we're almost making orbit here. So you can see our closest approach distance forming up there, though probably get worse than that right now because oh, we haven't made orbit yet. There we go. Um, but we could probably rendezvous in two orbits or so. That's more than enough. And so we have 633 meters per second left, which is a lot. For the moon, that's quite a lot. I mean, even for Earth orbit, a rendezvous you know, won't take more than 400 meters per second if you do it right. So we are catching up. Periaps aside, we should be high enough. I have smacked into the moon before though, so we'll keep an eye on that. Oh, there is a time warp restriction underneath uh, 30 kilometers. All right, I'll come back to you once we get things done. The gap right now is 400 kilometers, so it might take three orbits to catch up, maybe more. But we have plenty of supplies. Um, we have three days, well, two days and 11 hours of water, but basically three days. Okay, I lifted our orbit outside of the time warp restriction zone, and we are uh, getting closer and closer here. The nice thing about taking a little bit more time to rendezvous is that it's ultimately going to result in less relative velocity once you get there. So here we're going to be very close, but not quite close enough. And it'll, the next orbit we would actually be past the target, as you see. So we're going to go prograde and lift the opposite side up. Okay, eight kilometers, and then we need to correct the rest as an in inclination correction. So at that ascending node, I'll do that. Okay, the closest approach distance needs to be going up, so let's just go prograde and see if we can fix that. Yep, mm, that's close enough, 2.7 kilometers. That's just outside render range. Now you see with uh, care and patience, our relative velocity when we get to the target is only one meter per second. <laughs> uh, so and it didn't take that long, to be honest. So closing to within one kilometer, and then we'll do the final approach. Since we have so much fuel in this, I don't see a need to use extra in the command module except for the final docking sequence. Okay, now I'm gonna slow this down. That's fine. That's good enough. Let's switch vessels. Target. RCS on. On the opposite side, we'll just have kill rotation. And we're doing the negative parallel thing here again. 
but it should be just spot on really because we already had the other side point to us. In realism overhaul docking speed is around 0.2 to 0.3 meters per second. Okay that should be slow enough. And there should be enough magnetism to manage that gap. Yes there is. Okay so transfer crew and well we can get rid of the lunar module now. Lunar module is not controllable right now which I don't know I think there was some sort of way to remote control it at this point but we will accept that we just wanted to check that there weren't any Kerbals left inside and we will move away. We have quite a good deal of delta V left and when you're in a retrograde orbit coming back from the moon you start the maneuver there at 1 o'clock assuming you've oriented so that the moon's orbit is at 12 o'clock with the earth to your left then at about 1 o'clock you add the maneuver burn out you're expecting about 800 meters per second to get out looks like a little bit more and if uh, if you don't have quite the right place you won't be able to hit the atmosphere so huh for some reason it's taking nope nope it's because I'm am I at some sort of weird inclination why is it taking so much but this will do that's a little bit harsh though and that's a seven seven day trip back technically we have the resources but that's not right. So since we have the delta V, I'm gonna do a second burn. I hate to do this, but it's better than taking forever to get back home. Here we've got a four day trip. That's already quite a long time. And if we move it here, that's a six day trip. And that's uh, partly because we're going all the way out here and coming back in, which will be harsh on re-entry. If you see that your orbit is going past the moon's orbit, then you're going to have high re-entry heat when coming back home. So we want to avoid that. We want to make sure that the apoapsis is as low as possible. And if it doesn't quite make it into Earth's atmosphere because, I don't know, the weird inclination issues, um, then we're gonna have to do a secondary burn after the first one so we'll save we've got an extra bit of fuel for that so it's okay but watch out for that you might want to budget an extra 300 meters per second in case you're in this situation okay we are on escape away from the moon and shut down on our first burn so we are not going to this apoapsis, we're coming straight in and the apoapsis is not too high. What we're going to do is out here, bring our orbit down more. And it's going to cost that 200 to 300 that I told you about. So if you can, make sure you just do the burn around the moon, but I wasn't quite hitting it for some reason. And at this stage I'm a little bit impatient. If you are willing to take a week to get back to Earth and you know your heat shield can take it, then you don't have to do this other burn. You just move the maneuver node to closer to 12 o'clock and it'll work. Actually, it'll probably be less if we do this a little bit earlier. So compared to 270, doing it out there, moving it a little bit further ahead, we can actually bring it down to about 200. Basically we can plot this correction once we're outside of Lunar SOI. I suppose there must be a way of plotting it in Lunar SOI and building it into the main burn, but it's probably some radial or normal component. I'm gonna go for 60 kilometers. So on RCS fuel I used about half of it a little bit more than half of it. 
So it will be enough. Well, I should I shouldn't say half because some of that is reserved up here. So more than half of it. Okay, and at around 400 kilometers, we go orbit normal to ditch the service module. And I'm going to just manually activate the RCS up here now. And separate. Uh I don't want to separate anything extra. Uh, separate. There we go. And then this we can go surface negative velocity. We're turning on the scent mode. Changing our camera. And once we get closer to the atmosphere I'll adjust the roll. Initially we want to be at roll zero. And then we'll adjust the roll based on where our uh, where we are in relation to our periapsis. Okay, we're in the atmosphere, roll zero. I have no idea where we're coming down right now though, to be honest. And it's in the dark. Well, yeah, not the best orbit ever. Actually, we're tending towards the United States right now, if you take a look at the coordinates. But are we going to be over land or sea? That's more complicated. Now we need to turn pitch off at a certain point. We can do it here. Under 100 kilometers is fine. The service module will explode. And once you turn off the pitch control, it should tilt up like this if you're at roll zero. And it will be tilting down if you're at roll 180. This will produce a higher periapsis, so it's producing lift and at a certain point we want to reverse that because we don't want to get lift. We want to sort of hang out at around 60-ish kilometers. So I'll type that in, 180. And once we get close to the periapsis, I'll flip it around. For the longest time I didn't do this because I didn't have faith in KSP for and we, we don't really need yaw control, but yeah, let's turn off yaw control and start turning around. Um, because I was afraid of the capsule flipping out, but people convinced me to do this and it has been good. So now you can see the periapsis going down, but not very quickly. As long as you flip it around close to the periapsis, You'll basically hang out at this altitude for a while, allowing the apoapsis to come down and burning off speed at a region in the atmosphere that's not going to be too horrible. Well, the periapsis is pretty low now, so once we're pretty sure that we're not going to be going back outside of the atmosphere, we roll around again. And again, this lifts up our periapsis, but it's not lifting up so quick that our apoapsis will be outside the atmosphere. And now we're firmly suborbital. The lifting descent allows a control of g-forces, so we shouldn't get too many g's. We are going up a little bit here, but as long as it's not out of the atmosphere, it's fine can't really see it very well. Well, the US is over here, so we're over to Pacific, and you can sort of see the Hawaiian Islands here. So we're going to be north of Hawaii for the splashdown. Okay, forces are diminishing, and peak G forces were 4.7 Gs. Okay, I don't know the exact time of the separation of the forward heat shield at this point, but I figure as long as you're under the speed of sound, it's a good time to do it. So off it goes. And it sometimes floats back towards us. And then I'm going to arm the parachute. We still have descent mode on. And we are head down over the water in the pre-dawn haze. And at three kilometers, these parachutes come out. That's probably a little bit late for the drogue chutes. 
but that's what they're set to. And full parachute deployment. I mean, I guess it's... Con I don't know. I don't know how they figure it. But usually brings us to 9 meters per second. And splash down. Well, there you have it. That's how to execute an Apollo mission in Kerbal Space Program with realism mods and everything. Uh, of course, you can simplify that in any way you like, but that's basically how I would do it. And the water is not looking quite right here in the dark right now. Let's ignore that, and I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.